ora everyone. Welcome to Cobblestones Chronicles. On this beautiful Thursday morning, I actually feel as if summer is here. It's glorious out here in Masterton. I was driving up the road this morning thinking, gosh, imagine what our ancestors, the first settlers who came here, must have thought if they were leaving grey English weather and arriving in the Wararapa on a beautiful morning like this morning. I hope they did. It must have lifted their spirits no end. I was also, I um, dropped a couple of young friends who were staying with us at the moment out at Pukaha this morning so they could see the virgin forest out there, which is just absolutely beautiful. They're going to go and do the two-hour loop walk and um, see the eels being fed and the caca being fed and visit the kiwi and have a look at those. And they're from France and they were just lost in, in wonderment at how beautiful New Zealand is. I reckon that's one of the best things about having uh, young people from overseas who come and stay with us is um, seeing New Zealand newly through their eyes because they all wonder uh, and really enjoy it. So it's, it's lovely, it's lovely to be able to do that. These two are from France and they're um, very charming young people, very um, having a wonderful time in New Zealand and um, hopefully that will continue. So they may, I may have a couple of young people who are very um, tired and hungry when I pick them up later today. So anyway, back to Cobblestones. And um, at Cobblestones, we are celebrating. We, the Trust and the Friends, we're all celebrating together. What is absolutely wonderful is that we have signed a 99-year lease at the grand sum of $1 per year, which gives us security of tenure at Cobblestones. And here's, um, if you're watching on TV, I'm holding up the um, front page of Great Iron Grapevine magazine, so you can see all the participants. So we've got um, Great Iron Trust Lands Trust, who own the land and who have granted us the 99-year lease at a dollar a year, which means that we can continue to serve the community, have great events, and be the custodian of history for the Water Rapa, and uh, and continue to make our beautiful buildings available to everyone who comes and if so if you're watching on tv here they are here's the protagonists in this there's um Derek wilson phil holden andy holmes lucy cooper who of course you might know she does recuperate on this radio on sundays sometimes um helga perry uh, Joseph Gillard, who's our co-chair, next to Graham Gray, who's the other co-chair. Behind the two of them is Bob Toswell. Steve Merrick, um, who's, of course, the um, Pinehaven Orchards in Greytown. Myself and Derek Williams, who's an, another Greytown Trust Lands Trust trustee. And they have, over the years, been very generous to Cobblestones and making sure that it's a community facility that's available for all. And talking about a community facility, it's available on the 16th of December for you to come along and celebrate carols at Christmas with us. So carols at Cobblestones for Christmas, we'll have um, Dragonfly, the um, Masterton Band, We'll have um, a young man called Jack Brown. We'll also have Meg Hunter from Carterton, all providing us with music and some great Christmas carols to sing along to. There'll also be a picnic, so you can have a picnic if you want, or you can buy food from our, del our cafe. It's absolutely delicious, believe me. 
and we'll also have um we'll also have a cash bar so if you feel like celebrating with some christmas cheer you'll be able to buy a glass of wine or a bottle of wine and um a, a beer at the cash bar so bring along some cash cash bars um are useful things to have I know we don't carry cash anymore, do we? It's it's interesting how we've kind of given up carrying cash. I hardly ever carry cash. Um, they, were, they were collecting for uh, Wararapa Hospice outside the supermarket. And um, from what I've heard, the Wararapa Hospice do a fantastic job. And I thought, oh, no, I haven't got any cash. And, you know, sometimes keep $1.00 and coins, a couple of one dollar coins for parking meters, but that's about it. But she very cleverly had an F post machine, so I was able to give a bit more. I was very happy about that because I thought, right, good on you for collecting outside the supermarket and you deserve to get some money and the Wider Rapper Hospice certainly does deserve to get some money. Right, well, now, before I get into doing some real history stuff, I thought I'd play your song. And, as I've told you before, this, um, in August and, and in September this year, I um, spent some time in the UK with my sister, uh, which was, and her family, which was absolutely lovely. But it did amuse me that we went off to a shop called Little not long after I'd arrived there because my sister said she needed something that was from there. And there's um, two shops in the UK. One's called Little and the other one's called Aldi. And both of them are these interesting shops because they sell a collection of stuff that you might not always find in a supermarket shop. Um, they sometimes have wetsuits or sand shoes or all kinds of stuff. And this song is written by a friend of mine, Alistair Brown, who lives in Cornwall. He lives in St Ives now, actually, but he's originally Scottish. And it's about the dangers of going shopping in Little and Aldi. So here we go, the ballad well, of Little the and wife, Aldi. she broke her ankle after tumbling off her bike. Leaving me to do the housework, a job I never liked. And doing the weekly shopping seemed an awful chore to me, till I discovered little de aldi, little de aldi, little dee dee. Now I just can't wait for Thursdays when the specials go on view. I'm the first man to the trolleys, I'm the first man in the queue. For now I know what people mean by retail therapy. Thanks to Aldi, little d Aldi, little d Aldi, little d d. For its angle grinders and black puddings and a pot of German jam, a lump of hairy bacon and a wetsuit from Japan, a pack of streaky rashers and a crate of Russian stout and a portable generator just in case the lights go out. There's alloy wheels and windscreen wipers and a bag of rooster spuds. An inflatable rubber dinghy to help survive the floods. Spanners, sausages, fish fingers, they're so cheap they're damn near free. At little de aldi, little de aldi, little de aldi, little de dee. Now there's welding rods and prime organic beef to make a hearty stew. A hiking staff and spiky boots for climbing Kathmandu. Big heads of curly cabbage to make you eat your fill. Sledge hammers and bananas and a lovely cordless drill. And there's hatchets and hamburgers and there's tins of beans and peas. A petrol driven chainsaw for cutting bits off trees. Sabre saws and sausages, computers and TVs. At little de aldi, little de aldi, little de aldi, little de dee. Now the wife has gone ballistic, marriage heading for the rocks. With her crutches and her shopping bag, she's hobbling round the shops. And she's cut off all me credit cards. I'm sad as sad can be, thanks to Aldi, little de Aldi, little de Aldi, little de dee. For the shed is full of plastic shite I really didn't want. And the garden's full of furniture, and the house is full of plants. And I'm living in the doghouse, Rover, Fido, Shep and me, thanks to Aldi, little de Aldi, little de Aldi, little de dee. So no more angle grinders, no black puddings, no more pots of German jam, 
no lumps of hairy bacon, no more wetsuits from Japan, no packs of streaky rashers, and I'll have to do without a portable generator just in case the lights go out, no alloy wheels, no windscreen wipers, no more bags of rooster spuds, no inflatable rubber dinghies to help survive the floods. For I'm living in the doghouse, and I'm sad as sad can be, thanks to Aldi Little D, Aldi Little D, Aldi Little D. -D. <laughs> Alistair Brown with um, the ballad of Little and Aldi. Now, we don't always manage to escape the supermarket without a few additional things in the trolley, I've found. And when I lived in the UK for a few years um, with my husband, I've discovered that he was very good at putting additional things in the trolley. And we get to the checkout and I start, um, you know, loading and think, oh, I don't remember putting those chocolate biscuits into the tweet, into the trolley. So who knows? Um, this morning I thought I'd talk a little bit about Carterton because if you don't know, there's a really good heritage walk in Carterton. I'm holding up the brochure if you're watching on TV now. It's excellent. It's um, produced by Carterton District Historical Society and we're very fortunate in at Cobblestones to have um, Joseph... Um, Joseph Gillard, who is a resident of Carterton, and he um, represents the Carterton Council. He's Carterton Council's nominated representative on the trust board for Cobblestones. And he's um, very knowledgeable. He's a real historian, a social historian. Family came from this area, and he returned to it. So um, I think um, it's well worth thinking about some of the lovely, lovely buildings in Carterton. And um, Anderson's line is set certainly well worth looking at. Number 18 Anderson's line, for example, is Booth Cottage. The cottage was built in the 1870s to house the farmer of a worker at Booth Sawmill, which was opposite. The house was first sold on in 1920 and was bought by George Graves, a wagoner of Carterton, and it is still a private residence, but you can admire it from the outside. And um, Anderson's line is just where the road turns to the right uh, to go towards Masterton, so it's the big long road. There's also a farrier's cottage at 12 Anderson Line, built in the mid-1870s, believed to have been an early inhabitant um, from the farrier who shod horses used by Booth Sawmill. The original forge is to the right of the cottage. Now, we actually have an engine from Booth's Sawmill at at um, Cobblestones and we're hoping that one day when we get the engine shed and the horse-drawn vehicle shed built we'll actually be able to get it going again. We do have an engineer as who's part of the, the Friends group who reckons that um, it might well be able to be got going so it would be lovely to have it going again. Uh, the next one I want to tell you about is Carrington House at 285 High Street North, which is all very near, it's on the corner with Anderson's Line. It was built around 1874 and began as the home and shop of Edward Eagle and was positioned next to the road. In 1894-95, William Booth bought the property for his home and moved it to its current position closer to his large timber mill at the rear. The gardens were designed by Alfred Buxton. They're Category 2 listed um, with New Zealand heritage, Puhera Tonga. Of course, there's also Jensen's Cottage. 
Um, the cottage was built in the mid 1870s for Thomas Sunnex as a private dwelling. It's constructed from locally milled rough sawn totara and is one of a number of similar dwellings in the area. It's so lovely to see these old um, dwellings still being kept up and still being lived in, still being used. There's also the old saddlery at 133 High Street North. It was built in 1896. It is believed it was originally a butcher or possibly a fruit shop. It became a saddlery in 1933 and after World War II, Laddie Burdett established his saddlery here. Various horse tack was hung from hooks on the ceiling. Oh, it must have been a wonderful place to walk into and smell that tack, horse tack. It's got, always got a gorgeous square. So, of course, Memorial Square and the War Memorial in High Street North, Corner Park Road. The Cenotaph was unveiled in 1921 to commemorate World War I's fallen soldiers and was the first one completed in the Wairarapa. The names of foreign, fallen soldiers from World War II were later added. The square was the original site of the Parker home. It's a Category 2 listed monument. Isn't that lovely to know that it was added to instead of building another memorial? It um, almost makes me feel a bit sad, actually, to think of all those young men who went off to fight for king and country as they felt was their patriotic duty. And, um, of course, so many of them didn't ever come home. Such a sad story. So... Um, on that note, I'll play you another song. So what I might do is play um, I'll play you a song by um, a friend of mine, Alan, who lives in Hawke's Bay. He was brought up on a farm and um, he was, of course, a soldier's son. So let me play you Soldier Son by Alan Downs. I remember my old man Black Beret he wore Never seemed to smile at much When I was just a boy Coming home at sunset A grimy dusty face In the fireside in the evening With his whiskey and newspaper Well he never heard our questions Never had the time Never had the patience For precocious little minds Farming always consuming newspapers were amusing Adventures of a ten-year-old, not a pastime of his choosing They fill your head with all that stuff their fathers gave to them Turn you loose into the world, they tell you you're a man And all the time you're looking back and questioning your mind Would my old man have understood the place that I am now? Ah, but he could play a tune when the whiskey glass was empty Sang the songs of his younger days and he laid them in my memory Some days on the radio like forgotten nursery rhymes They play the songs my father sang and he's right there in my mind Now all that there remains of the man I thought I knew Black Beret song he sang and the life he gave to me my father was a soldier long before I was born One thing we truly share, he was a soldier's son They fill your head with all that stuff their fathers gave to them Turn you loose into the world, they tell you you're a man All the time you're looking back and questioning your mind 
would my old man have understood the place that I am now? I remember my old man, a black beret he wore. Never seemed to smile that much when I was just a boy. Coming home at sunset, grimy, dusty face. In the fireside by the evening with his whiskey and newspaper. Ah, but he could play a tune when the whiskey glass was empty. Sang the songs of his younger days and he laid them in my memory. Some days on the radio, like forgotten nursery rhymes. They play the songs my father sang and he's right there in my mind. They fill your heads with all that stuff their fathers gave to them. Turn you loose into the world, they tell you you're a man. All the time you're looking back, questioning your mind. Would my old man have understood the man that I am now? I remember my old man, a black beret he wore. Brought it home in 45, never said what he went there for. Soldier's Son, um, which of course there was, as the as Alan says, his father was also the son of a soldier who had fought in the First World War. Um, Alan's father fought in the Second World War and came home um, on a, a ship and met his future wife on the ship because she was coming out to New Zealand to um, be... Uh, now, what was she coming for? I believe she was going to be an actress. So there you go. Um, so back to uh, Carterton. The Wairau Rapa... So uh, uh, those of you who know the square in Carterton, um, the... There is the Wairau Rapa Electric Power Board building on High Street North Memorial Square. And built in 1925, it's a beautiful example of the popular Art Deco style. Its heavily reinforced brick construction withstood the 1934 and 1942 earthquakes. So it's a pretty sturdy building, that one. There's, of course, also King's Woodworking and Joinery Workshop at 66 Broadway. That was built in 1907 by D.T. King, and this building housed five generations of the King family as wood joiners and at one time also supplied Carterton with coffins. The business, unfortunately, finally closed in 2018. Then there's Carterton Railway Station, which is a lovely, lovely, typical country station. It's in Wheatstone Street, and the station was built in 1879, ready for the opening of the railway through Carterton in late 1880. It was decommissioned, but is the third oldest station in New Zealand, still on its original site, and occasionally is open, particularly when we have the Daffodil Express or one of the other delightful um, journeys through uh, along the um, Masterton Line. There's also um, a notable building, it's the Mansfield Building at 58 High Street North. It was built in 1919 as a drapery by William Mansfield and later became Watts's Drapery and was frequented by Wellington patrons who appreciated the fashionable women's clothing which was sourced in Auckland. Sounds like it was uh, the place to go. I think Carterton Main Street might have been, because 
Carterton was a bit bigger, of course, and served a bigger area. It might have been a bit um, more populated, you know, had more shops than Greytown originally had. Because, of course, Greytown it did go uh, very quiet, economically quiet, which was one of the reasons that actually it still got a, a lot of the old buildings because they didn't get knocked down. The old bakery at 25 High Street North was built in the mid-1880s. This building was a bakery for almost a hundred years until the mid-1980s. It was a tea room in the shop with private accommodation above and the original brick bakehouse can still be seen behind the shop. It's worth going to have a look. Rechabite Lodge Hall at 47 Holloway Street, originally built in 1888 as a livery stable on the Rose Edge. This building has been used as a hall to house various lodges and for a range of commercial enterprises, including a radio station. Carterton had its own radio station. It has been beautifully restored and it's now a private dwelling. But of course the Rechabites were the ones who were very against the spiritous liquor and um, you had to sign the charter that you would, that spiritous liquor or beer would never pass your lips. The Masonic Hall um, was also uh, consecrated in May 1887. It was built by a local builder, Mr. Kemp, and was provided a permanent home for St. Mark's Masonic Lodge, which had been founded in 1884. Major structural alterations were made in the 1860s and 1870s, so it's not quite the same. But um, it's still, there are some just lovely buildings along, so it's well worth it walk along um, the high street. There's also, of course, a very nice coffee place to have a coffee called, I think it's now called Aunt Ginger's. It was a uh, phenom before then. But um, although its name may have changed, let me tell you that the food inside is just as good. Okay, so as we're on the th the theme of New Zealand um, backcountry, I thought I'd play Balak Matai, which is, of course, was written by Peter Capes. Um, beautiful, beautiful, um, beautiful songwriter. And um, it's a beautiful song, if a little sad. Of course, deer were introduced into New Zealand mountains for sport originally, but with our mild climate and, of course, no predators, because we don't have bears, and we don't have... The only predators we have are human beings. Their numbers grew so great that their overgrazing caused disastrous um, erosion. So deer colours were paid to shoot them. And this um, song, written by Peter Irwin Cape. Um, mm, sorry, there was a big lorry or something went past just now. Um, in, I'm not too sure when he wrote it, some, sometime I think in the 60s. And it's about a deer hunter coming home. So I hope you enjoy Black Mat Eye. <laughs> What's I you singing? Black Matai, Black Matai. The snow's on the tops, fire's burning down. What's I you singing? East wind in Matai. My love's left the station, she's gone to the town. What are you chattering? Tall mountain birches The winds in the west Rain's pelting down The flash floods are coming I'm bound to keep moving My 
love's left the station She's gone to the town The 80 pound pack that keeps dragging me down I'll get out of these mountains Get back to the sheepyard My love's left the station She's gone to the town What are you whispering? Wind in the snow grass, combing the tussocks, folding them down. My love's hair was golden, like snow grass in summer. My love's left the station, she's gone to the town. Lovely. So that was a combination of Black Matai by uh, Peter Capes and uh, the last little bit was Jack's Waltz and that was written by Lynn Wilkinson while they were staying in Tauranga with her, with Lynn's father Jack and um, this uh, song was uh, sung by Lynn Wilkins and Michael McKinnon who are known as Wilkie Mac. And that was lovely to hear today. Um, going back to Carterton, so we've um, looked at the Masonic Lodge building, which is worth looking at, although it's not always, it's not, a lot of it isn't original now. But there's the Carterton Community Courthouse in Holloway Street. Built in 1884 on High Street, this building has been moved twice, first to the current Carterton District Council site and later to its present location in Holloway Street. 
It served as a courthouse until its functions were subsequently moved to Masterton. But of course, now it's uh, it's available for hire, so community groups can use it at a very reasonable price. I recommend it. Um, there's also the Band Rotunda in Carrington Park in High Street, much loved. This was built in 1911 or, or 1912 to commemorate the coronation of King George V. New Zealand Governor Gen General Lord Jellico gave a public speech on the bandstand in 1922. It's a Category 2 listed New Zealand Heritage Building. Uh, real Putheri Taonga. Just a delightful place. And of course, now and again, a band plays in there. And one uh, Saturday evening I was driving past and there was a whole choir of young people, I would say a church group, singing hymns. Just lovely to see it getting used like that. Now, not far away is Wakeland's Flour Mill, 147 High Street South. The building was moved to this site in 1869 from its original site on the banks of the Manga Tereri stream. Um, and it was moved by its owner, Edward Wakeland. It was Carterton's first flour mill and its longest running business until it closed in 1964. It is a Category 1 listed heritage building and it has been um, being renovated recently or, or conserved, I think maybe is the proper term for it, because it looks um, very well done. Then, of course, the St Mark's Anglican Church on 185 High Street South. And St Mark's is a beautiful church built of wood in 1874 by Thomas Bennett in the Gothic Revival style with a cruciform floor plan typical of early New Zealand Anglican churches. It was fully funded by early Carterton settlers and it's a Category 2 listed New Zealand heritage Puheri Taonga. And a friend of mine, Robin, who comes over from um, the other coast, she comes over from Plymouthton, oh, probably once every couple of months, and they come and stay with us. When we go past, she always insists on stopping and going in and enjoying the building because her grandfather and grandmother were married there. And she's got some quite strong connect connections to the Wairarapa. And I have to say that we've um, taken her into the um, archives, Wairarapa archives, and she said it was absolutely fantastic. And she was in there for forever, so her husband and I ended up going and having a cup of coffee somewhere. And recently another friend of mine who has a family connections to the Wairarapa has been over um, doing some family research, and she can't give enough praise to Wairarapa archives. She said they have been so helpful, so um, so much information she's had out of them that um, she's coming back again soon, actually. She ended up staying an extra night with us because um, she'd been so long at the archives it was a bit late to go back home over the Ramatakas. And finally, on um, at 291 High Street South, this Ridgeway Cottage, built in 16, no, sorry, 1862 as a private de dwelling for James Ridgeway. It is the oldest building remaining in Carterton and it's still used as a private dwelling. The bakery to the south was used until the early 1900s. So that's a, a canter along Carterton High Street. And um, you don't realise, because I drive along it quite a lot, but it's such a long high street, isn't it? And if you walk along it, it's well worth doing it. Um, they were The Carterton's first settlers were mostly newly arrived from England in the 1850s. Um, the early settlers in the Carterton district, of course, the Tangata Whenua, were the Rangitane and Nati Kahungnu people. 
Governor George Gray began the government purchase of the Taratahi Plains from Roka, local Rangatiri using a contentious process in 1853. In 1857, a settlement at Three Mile Bush was established, and those early settlers had travelled over the Rumataka Range or via the coast by Bullock Dray or on foot, and were employed to build a road linking the Greytown and Masterton settlements, which of course were both small farm settlements. The Carterton settlers were enticed by the chance to purchase 10 acre blocks of land but they were very challenging, boggy and bush covered. And um, as I was driving back down the road this morning, I saw that there was one of the paddocks uh, that I think as long as I've been here has been a grass paddock and it had been turned over and I was looking at all the stones in it and I was thinking, oh my goodness, these poor settlers, they cleared the bush they turned over the paddock and would get confronted with all these stones. And they must have felt despair because clearing the bush was um, a pretty tough job as well. In 1859, three villages, Three Mile Bush, Broadway and Clareville, were amalgamated into one township. It was named Carterton in honour of Mr Charles Rooking Carter, who was the principal promoter of the township in his role as representative on the Provincial Council. He was a generous benefactor responsible for many early public facilities and initiatives in Carterton and his statue is prominently displayed in Millennium Park, High Speed, High Street North. I recommend it because his statue is actually right next to one of my favourite cafes and you can always pop in there and have a look at the yummy things to eat and the delightful bread um it's it's a, a lovely place it's a lovely place to go and you can raise a cup of coffee to mr charles rooking carterton i'm holding if you're watching on tv i'm holding up his photograph now so you can see it um it's he was a, a fine looking man who lived from 1822 to 1896 so here's a little brochure that I've just been reading from this morning. Thank you very much, Carterton District Historical Society. You've done a grand job. And they're asking if anyone's got any more photographs, could they get in contact with them? Because they're always interested in putting more photographs into their archives um, so that they can help. And... Um, my friend Philippa also mentioned that she went into the Carterton District Historical Society whose offices are on um, High Street North and said that the ladies in there were more than helpful, just lovely and looked after them really, really well. So, as I said, we have some celebrations at Cobblestones. And we're very grateful to Great Iron Trust Lands Trust for entrusting us with the land and to make sure that we make good use of it. The lease is making sure that we are using it for what we've stated it's going to be for. So come along and celebrate with us on the, on the um, 16th of December. Bring a picnic or, or eat your own, uh, eat our delicious food. And there's also um, going to be fantastic music, sausages, of course, for sale, and a cash bar. Now, before I go, I thought I'd play you another song. I thought I'd play you um, a beautiful song, which is um, <laughs> uh, it's about um, joining up. And, um, and also farewelling. So it's the parting glass. And the parting glass is a traditional song. The Scots um, argue that it's theirs. 
the Irish argue it's theirs. The um, Northern English have said, well, actually it came from us and we gave it both of you, but who knows. Um, it's, it's a lovely song to be sung when you're farewelling somebody, the parting glass. So here it, um, it dates back to at least 1605, if not earlier. So it was supposedly the most popular parting song sung in Scotland before Robert Burns wrote Auld Lang Syne, which of course is our most popular song to sing now at New Year. So here we go. I'm going to um, play you The Parting Grass, and sung by um, Wilkie Mack. Oh, I know the money the dear I had I spent it in good company Welcome back again. 
But since it has sorted me by a time to rise and a time to fall, come fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy. Isn't that lovely rendition of The Parting Glass? And that was Lynn Wilkins and Michael McKinnon. And um, they're both good New Zealanders, but Michael is very fond of Celtic music because he has Scottish heritage. With a name like McKinnon, you'd have to have, wouldn't you? And um, so does Lynn Wilkins, I believe. And they play together so beautifully, such lovely traditional music and um, that's off a cd which is uh, called the pleasure will be mine if you're interested so back to fine just finishing up on carterton today because today was really a bit of a canter around carterton and um it's a lovely uh, little town which um was really set up because there was such uh, a need for good roading so it was a kind of a roading capital. And what I love about Carterton, of course, is the daffodil, the daffodils, known as the daffodil capital. And um, Alfred Booth started Carterton on the pathway to becoming the daffodil capital of the country when he planted acres of bulbs in the paddocks surrounding his middle run homestead. Booth and his son Henry, who bred and exhibited daffodils, named them after the grandchildren, opened the daffodil gardens to the public to raise funds for the local branch of the Plunkett Society. And um, Gray and Hofstede named their subdivision of Charles Strait Daffodil Grove in honour of Carterton's flower. And wasn't that lovely? And it's wonderful to think that this year, we had the Daffodil Festival again in Carterton. I think we've all missed it a lot. And it was just lovely to be able to enjoy ourselves and be around with, with, the, with the daffodils. Just a, a pretty place to be. Well, that's about it for me for this week. I hope you've enjoyed our little canter around Carterton. And if there's anything that you would like to know about the history of the Wairarapa, um, do let me know through Cobblestone's Facebook page because Cobblestone's is, of course, a regional historic um, museum and it's, it's always, I'm always happy to try and find out information. I don't necessarily know, guarantee that I'll find out, but I'll give it a go. So... Lovely to be with you. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great couple of weeks until I'm with you again. Meantime, take care and enjoy summer sunshine. Yay for more of it. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>